Shalom, everyone. My name is Tony Pino, and today I'm going to take you on a history walk. We're going to walk through history to see what, what happened to the Torah observant believers of Yeshua in the first century. Did they go on into the second century and centuries beyond, or did they just fade away? Did Western Christianity's doctrine date all the way back to the first century, or is it after the first century? Let's find out today. We're going to be going through a lot of quotes, uh, a lot of extra biblical sources. And one thing we want to keep in mind is that when looking at extra biblical sources, whether Jewish or whether Western Christian, that that is not God breathed. That's the opinions of men. And that's where a lot of doctrines are brought forth. Uh, the doctrines of men are brought forth here. And you need to what? Study to show yourself approved. You need to study to see, did they get it right? Don't just assume they have it right, but look and study to show yourself approved. Try to find out the history of where these things began and why they began. And you will be amazed, I think, at what you find. I know I was. And so a lot of people today are sitting in assemblies and they are believers in Yeshua. They've been saved by grace. They've come in. But the discipleship that is going on, oftentimes they don't know where those doctrines came from. They're just assuming that they came from the first century. And that's not always the case. They're assuming that they line up with covenants. That's not always the case. You see, you have to understand covenants to understand the Bible. We have to understand the historical context, the language, the culture, amen, and covenants. That's how we're going to understand the Bible in its proper context. And oftentimes, after the first century, many followers got away from it, which is why we have many heretics throughout the centuries. We have a lot of uh, councils that come together to try and decide what doctrine is true, what isn't, because there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on today. So know your Bible. Know where your doctrines came from. That's what this teaching is going to help you with, I believe. But you study to show yourself approved. Amen. All right. So, but if you find that you like this, uh, this video, if you like the teaching that I did on the history of doctrines, uh, the history of believers in Yeshua, and you want to know more about what I teach, just hit the subscribe button there on the right-hand side. That'll take you to my YouTube channel. And I have all kinds of different topics that I teach on to show you why I believe the way I do. Amen. You can hit the like button. You can pass the video around. You can even leave comments. Amen. Whether you agree or disagree, that's okay. As long as it's cordial, it can stay up. All right. All right. Let's go ahead and get to the PowerPoint and let's do this history lesson. Amen. This is called followers of the way. That term, the way, was a term used for followers of Yeshua in the Bible. We're going to see that here in a little bit. The term the way comes from when Yeshua said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come unto the Father except through me. And that's where that title comes from. It's connecting those people to Yeshua. And it's simply a title that was given to the followers of Yeshua in the first century. It's the most used title that you're going to see in the Bible. So sometimes when I am teaching from the apostolic writings, I get challenged by Western Christians on my interpretation because it shows a pro-law or law of Moshe stance for all followers of Yeshua in the first century. They claim I'm going against 2,000 years of Christian orthodoxy. Is this true? Nope. One must understand today there is no monolithic Torah followers of Yeshua sect, just as there is no monolithic Western Christianity. Right. Everyone knows today within Western Christianity, there's hundreds, if not thousands of denominations. What is orthodoxy? Well, not everyone agrees on that. And now you're going to try and tell me that I'm not standing on 2000 years of Christian orthodoxy. Yeah, that's that's a problem. Even when we look at today's Torah followers, there's not a monolithic all agreement by all Torah followers uh, on doctrine. There are different assemblies holding different beliefs and you need to study it out and see does it line up with scripture so we must be careful about making sweeping remarks saying hey yeah i'm a christian i believe this oh you're a christian yeah you're a christian what does that mean to be a christian i often ask people please give me a definition of what a christian is what type of christian are you are you lutheran are you catholic are you calvinist because they don't all believe the same thing and they might not call each other christians and so what is orthodoxy? Well, that depends on who you ask. Same thing with Torah followers. There's all kinds of different kinds of Torah followers. Don't make blanket statements about 
yeah, if, if you're a follower of Torah and you're a believer in Yeshua, then you must believe this, this, and this. No, ask them. Ask them to give their definitions so that you're not misrepresenting them. There's too many straw man arguments out there right now. So the title Christian in the first century doesn't carry the same definition it does today. And I'm sorry, but it doesn't. The title Christian in the first century was a Torah observant follower of Yeshua. Today, when someone says Christian, I'm a Christian, that's not what they're trying to say. And there's many other attachments to it when they say I'm a Christian. So please help uh, to clear things up. Please ask people to give their definition of what a Christian is so that you can have a good, solid discussion. You know, good, cordial, beneficial, fruitful discussion. Amen. So the term orthodoxy, the term orthodoxy just means right belief. Right. Orthodoxy is belief or adherence to traditional or affirmed creeds notable in religion. In the Christian sense, the term means conforming to the Christian faith as represented in the creeds of the early church. The first seven ecumenical councils were between the years of 325 and 787 AD with the purpose of establishing accepted doctrines. You see, that definition of what a Christian is is not, for me, a first century definition of what a Christian is. By the time you get to 325 with the Nicene Council, you have many things that they're going to uh, believe as correct doctrine. They're going to establish it as correct doctrine. That is not biblical. It's not found in the Bible. All right. And that's through proper study of history, through proper study of the word. So, no, we have to understand terms here and what is accepted doctrines. Then we get to the Protestant Reformation. See, they're not even going to agree on what is orthodoxy, right? When it comes to the Roman Catholic Church, which is basically established there at 325 through the Nicene Council. So the Protestant Reformation began in Wittenberg, Germany on October 31st, 1517, when Martin Luther, a teacher and a monk, a Catholic monk, published a document uh, he called Disputation on the Power of Indulgences, or the 95th Theses. The document was a series of 95 ideas about Christianity that he invited people to debate with him. See, he's debating against orthodoxy here, all right? which is why you know later on he's going to have to hide for his life because he's pushing against what a huge power structure. He's pushing against doctrines of men is what he's pushing against, right? And just like in the first century, when you pushed against the Pharisees, you were pushing against a massive power structure. And that's why they pushed back on Yeshua. And that's why eventually they uh, conspired to kill him, both them and of course the Kohanim, the priesthood, because he pushed against their doctrines of men. They couldn't find him guilty of Torah because he never taught you to break Torah but he did violate the doctrines of men. And that's what's happening with the Reformation age. And that's why we have so many different Christianities. It has to do with doctrines of men. That's why rabbinic Judaism is the way it is. It's doctrines of men. Okay, so we have to study those doctrines and see which ones hold up to scripture and which ones don't. Now, when looking at scripture, we got that term, the way, all right? We first see it in Acts chapter nine. These are followers of Yeshua. And at this moment, Shaul, Paul, is after them. So it says he's still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord when went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to. Okay, so Paul here, he is a what? High-ranking lawyer. All right. The Sanhedrin recognized his authority, recognized his knowledge. He sat under Gamliel. They're giving him, he's like a diplomat going to other countries and having the authority to arrest people. So he knows the Torah very well, and he knows the doctrines of men extremely well. He is a lawyer, in my, my opinion, from my studies. And the high priest recognized him. So he's going to persecute those of the way. Those are followers of Yeshua. These are Torah-observant Jews. Okay, these are not people who have forsaken the Torah. No, it is a Jewish, what, sect. And so they are Torah followers. 
Acts chapter 19. All right. Paul has come to faith in Yeshua. He is now preaching the gospel. He now knows the difference between the doctrines of men and the Torah. He understands the teachings of Yeshua. This is a pro-Torah stance that Paul is taking. He understands where the doctrines of men are going wrong because he knows that that's what Yeshua was against. The doctrines of men that violated the Torah. Not all doctrines violated the Torah within Judaism or the Judaisms of the day. Remember, that's plural form, right? But Paul could weave through that and understand what the true gospel message was that Yeshua was proclaiming and how to disciple people in the Torah. So Paul went into the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, debating and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some were becoming hardened and disobedient, speaking evil of the way, before the people, he withdrew from them and took away the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannaeus. So it's a Jewish sect. This is a Jewish conversation. Amen. All of the apostolic writings are Jewish at heart. They're coming from that culture. They're coming from context of covenants. Right. And Paul understands this. So right here, they are all still Torah observant Jews, but they have faith in Yeshua. Amen. He is their Messiah and they are walking out that faith, which means they are walking in a covenant relationship with Yeshua, walking out the Torah. So Acts 19, 23 and 26. About that time, there occurred no small disturbance concerning the way. You see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but also throughout all Asia. Paul had persuaded and perverted a considerable yeah perverted a considerable crowd saying that handmade gods are not gods at all all right so Paul's preaching the gospel message the truth that they need to leave their paganism he's teaching them the truth about the idols that they're worshiping he is one of the way all right he's being a light to all nations that's what you're supposed to do as a Jew you're supposed to be a light to all nations Amen. And bringing them the gospel message of Yeshua, bringing them into Israel. Remember, we are grafted into the covenants of Israel, as Paul says in Romans chapters 9 through 11. The wild olive branches, which is the Gentiles, are grafted into the natural olive tree, which is Israel. Amen. And her covenants. So those of the way, those are followers of Yeshua, Torah observant followers. And Paul is going all throughout Asia, which means that's where the seven assemblies were that you see in the in the book of Revelation. Those seven assemblies are all over there in what at this time is called Asia. So it is the diaspora. So Acts 22, verse 4, Paul says, I persecuted this way, meaning the people of the way, to the death, binding and putting both men and women in prisons. Okay, so this is the common terminology used for followers of Yeshua. Now we're going to pick up a second term here, which is going to be the one that really carries over uh, into the later centuries for Torah observant followers of Yeshua. Now, in Acts 24, verse 5, it says, For we have found this man to be a pest, meaning Paul, stirring up riots among all the Jewish people throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarene, meaning Nazarene. Okay, Yeshua was from Nazareth, so his followers were called the sect of the Nazarenes. This is just pointing to Yeshua. It's a Jewish sect, amen? And so he even tried to defile the temple there, they're claiming, but we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to learn from him all these things which, about which we accuse him, okay? So the important thing I want you to learn from here is there's another term called the Nazarenes. These are Torah observant Jewish followers of Yeshua. And they accused Paul of being the ringleader of this sect. Okay. Now, what we want to do now is we're going to go ahead and read these verses in the book of Acts right now. So I can show you that Paul never forsook the Torah. He never forsook the Torah, which means teaching both Gentile and both Jews to keep the Torah after coming to faith in Yeshua. After you've been saved by grace, we maintain your walk in the kingdom by following the law of Moshe. All right, so here we are in Acts 21. 
Paul is coming home from one of his missionary journeys. They've already had Acts 15. They have already decided that circumcision okay, is not going to be required for salvation, but following the law of Moshe is required because what? It is still the laws of the kingdom. Acts 15 said no to circumcision, but yes to the laws of Moshe. And we see that they gave them four requirements. We're going to read about it here in just a minute. And these was like a starter pack because it was all about how do we fellowship with these Gentiles that are coming into the kingdom? They're going to be coming into our synagogues. They're going to be coming into our houses. How do we fellowship with them? And they come out of paganism because they will make us ritually unclean. Well, we get the four laws there. And the four laws, they have to do with capital punishment oftentimes. So there are very serious things that the Gentiles need to stop right away because they're coming out of paganism. But then they're going to learn the law of Moshe as they go to Shabbat every, I mean, go to the synagogues every Shabbat, right? You'll see that in verse 21 of Acts 15. But now we're in Acts 21. And just in case you might have misunderstood Acts 15 to say that, oh, they're not requiring the law of Moshe anymore. Well, we need to go a little bit further and we will show you that yes, Paul is still following the law of Moshe. So in Acts 21, we see that Paul and others, uh, when they arrive in Jerusalem, starting with verse 17, the brothers and sisters welcomed us gladly. On the next day, Paul went in with us to Jacob. All the elders were present. After greeting them, he reported to them in detail what God has done among the Gentiles through his service. And when they heard, they began glorifying God. They said, you see, brothers, how many myriads there are among the Jewish people who have believed, and they are all zealous for the Torah. This is tens of thousands of Jews, and they are still zealous for the Torah. Perfect opportunity for Paul to say, whoa, whoa wait a minute. That was nailed to the cross. You guys need to get off that, right? It's all just by grace now. You know, you don't need to do the law of Moshe. Is that what Paul's going to say here? Nope, not at all. Jacob goes on to say in verse 21, they have been told about you that you teach all the Jewish people among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or to walk according to the customs. What do you, what's to be done then? No doubt they will hear that you have come. Okay, there's this big misunderstanding that Paul is teaching for them to forsake the law of Moshe, but Paul's going to straighten this out. So Jacob tells Paul, do what we tell you. We have four men who have a vow on themselves. Take them and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. That way, all will re realize there is nothing to the things they have been told about you, but that you yourself walk in an orderly manner, keeping the Torah. This is Paul's perfect opportunity to say, well, no, I don't. I don't have to. I don't have to keep the Torah. He doesn't say that, does he? Oh, that's been nailed to the cross. Oh, Yeshua did away with it. Hey, if I do any type of offerings, oh man, that is like blasphemy against what Yeshua did on the cross. No, nope, that's not Paul's response. Paul does it. Paul follows through with it. He follows through with what Yaakov tells him to do. That's because the law of Moshe has not been done away with. Then it goes on to say, as for the Gentiles who have believed, however, we have written by letter what we decided for them to abstain from what is offered to idols and from blood and from what is strangled and from immorality. These are capital punishment issues in the Torah, right? You can't walk around still uh, worshiping Yahweh and still being a pagan. No, that is blasphemy. You can't go around drinking blood, eating blood. You can't eat what's strangled because that's connected to idolatry. You will become ritually unpure. You'll contaminate the community. And then, of course, sexual immorality, that's not permitted. That's still found in the Torah. So these things you must do right away because it affects your fellowship with fellow believers. And then, of course, in Acts 15, it says you will then go on. Basically, all of what the law of Moshe is spoken of is read in the synagogues. They will come on Shabbat to hear exactly more on how they are to live. They're not supposed to get the full weight of Torah put on them all at once. They didn't grow up with it. Okay, This is grace. This is discipleship. Yes, they have to follow the law of Moshe, but let's teach them. Let's show them how to do it. But we as Jews, we grew up. We know what to do. So 
yeah, it's it's a matter of giving grace to the Gentiles, but it, in all cases means following the Torah. All right, so Paul, he goes on in Acts 24. We read a little bit about this, but we're going to start from the beginning here. And it says, after five days, the Kohen Gadol, Ananias, came down with some of the elders and an attorney named Tertullius. See, at first, the high priest gave Paul the papers. Now Paul has flipped the script and become a believer. Now he's got to bring another attorney, another lawyer down and try and trap Paul, right? It says they brought formal charges against Paul before the governor. When Paul was called in, Tertullius began to accuse him, saying, we are enjoying much peace through you, and reforms are introduced uh, for this nation because of your foresight. We acknowledge this, most excellent Felix, in every way and every place with all gratitude. But in order that I may not weary you any longer, I beg you in your kindness to hear us briefly. For we have found this man, Paul, to be a pest, stirring up riots among all the Jewish people throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazaretim. Okay, The Nazaretim is Nazarenes, followers of Yeshua, Torah followers. Amen. And we know <laughs> those within the Sadducee party don't always uh, tell the truth. Look what they did to Yeshua. They lied and did an illegal trial just to get him on the cross. So, yeah, they're lying here, of course, about Paul. Now, verse 6, he even tried to defile the temple, but we seized him. Okay, Many believe that he was accused of bringing Gentiles into the court area. Of course, he never did, Okay, because these Gentiles were, of course, uncircumcised. And so Paul is not going to break the Torah by bringing uncircumcised people into the temple grounds area where they're not permitted. No, but they are lying. But let's go on. Uh, verse 8, by examining him yourself, you will be able to learn from him all these things which, about which we accuse him. The Judean leaders also joined in attack affirming that these things were true. When the governor nodded for him to speak, Paul responded. Okay, let's see what Paul's response is. Knowing that you have been judged over this nation for many years, I gladly make my own defense. As you can verify, it is no more than 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship. They did not find me arguing with anyone or inciting a riot, not in the temple or in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city, nor can they prove to you the charges they now bring against me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way, okay, which is they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything written in the Torah and the prophets. You see that term, the way, we're Torah observant Jews. All right, they taught you how to follow Torah correctly, and Gentiles would have been included. And he says, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything written in the Torah and the prophet. That means obeying it. In God, I have hope which these men also wait for, that there will surely be a resurrection of both the righteous and the unrighteous. Therefore, I do my best always to have a clear conscience before both God and man. Now, after several years, I came to bring Zedekah, this means what? Offerings for the poor, to my country for the poor and to present offerings. Well, wait a minute, Paul. I thought you don't need to present offerings. I thought that would be blasphemous to present offerings. Oh, no, Paul was presenting animal offerings, even by his own confession, okay? Because it does not violate what Yeshua did on the cross. It points you to him. So he is walking in obedience to the Torah. As I was doing this, they found me in the temple, having been purified without any crowd or uproar. But there were some Jewish people from Asia who ought to be here before you to press charges if they have anything against me. Or let these men themselves tell what wrongdoing they found when I stood before the Sanhedrin. Except for this one, I cried, I shouted out while standing among them, it is about the resurrection of the dead that today I am on trial before you. Okay, It's not about violating the Torah, because Paul never violated the Torah in his teachings. He taught you how to keep the Torah correctly by his own testimony. And we can even see that this will carry on into chapter 25. And so when we get to chapter 25, they're accusing him. And it says, when he arrived, the Judeans who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing against him many serious charges, which they could not prove. 
Okay, they couldn't prove them. Paul said in his defense, I have committed no offense against the Torah of the Jewish people, which means he's teaching you to keep it, or against the temple, which means it's perfectly permitted for uh, within his teachings for you to what? Go do animal offerings. It's part of the commandments. It's commanded. He's not going against the temple or against Caesar. Caesar gave permission for Jews to follow the Torah. Paul is not violating the Torah. He might be violating traditions of men, but he's not violating the Torah, which means teaching others how to keep the Torah. All right, Acts 28, this is at the end of his life, before he dies. It happened that after three days, Paul called together those who were prominent Jewish leaders. When they had gathered, he said to them, brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. I have not taught anything against the Torah. Okay, this is Acts 28, 17. At the end of his life, he's confessing that he follows the Torah as a believer in Yeshua. This means all of his assemblies, everywhere he goes, all the places that he had disciples, he taught them Torah. They are called the people of the way. They are called the sect of the Nazarene, the Nazarenes. Amen. Now, let's look at this word Christian now. What is the definition of a Christian in the first century? Let's talk about that. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. All right, so the word Christian is used three times in the apostolic writings. We got Acts 11.26, Acts 26.28, and 1 Peter 4.16. This word simply means followers of Christ or followers of Messiah. These were Torah observant followers, also called the way or Nazarenes. The term Christian from the mid-2nd century forward took on a different meaning. The term began holding an anti-law stance along with the birth of replacement theology. That is the truth, my friends. In the first century, that term Christian basically meant Messianic Jew, a follower of Messiah. Amen. And what type of Jew was Yeshua? He was a Torah observant Jew who was fulfilling the covenant promises to Israel. He has not forsaken Israel. Israel has not been replaced. The body of Messiah is within Israel, not something outside called the church. That word church is a later invented word that comes into our English language at about the 11th or 12th century, uh, 10th century, maybe. You know, there is some evidence of it being there in the 10th century, uh, but it is an invented word because replacement theology had already been up and running hard. And so they are trying to distinguish themselves from Israel. That's why we don't like that word church, because it carries with it baggage. When you use the word church and you talk about first century uh, people, you're using it acronistically because you have a definition of what that word church is. And that's not found in the first century. And that's the pushback that we need to do because it affects how you read the Bible. This is why when you read in English, the translations that use the word church, that is being used acronistically, okay? It's taking a word that was invented in the 10th, 11th, 12th century and reading it back into the first century. The definition is not the same, okay? So please, please, please be careful of the word Christian. Be careful of the word church. We need to define it biblically, amen? All right, let's talk about uh, 70 AD. So in 70 AD, the Roman general Titus suppressed the first Jewish revolts, all right, which happened between 67 and 70 AD by utterly destroying Jerusalem and burning the temple. The Judeo-Christian community in Jerusalem escaped this terrible catastrophe by fleeing to Pella in the Transjordan and the countryside of Gilim and Bashan. So over there in the Transjordan. These are what Torah following believers. They're from Jerusalem. They're Messianic Jews and there are Gentiles in there also. But these are the assemblies there in Jerusalem. And right before the Romans surrounded everything, they escaped to Pella. Some Christians return after 70 AD and seemed to have built a Christian synagogue. So notice the terminology being used here, right? Here, Christian means Torah observant, because Christian means 
they're building a synagogue. They're not building a church. All right. So sometimes called the church of the apostles. Well, yeah, this is later. This is way later, over a thousand years later. They were building synagogues when they came back. Okay. Now, Bargill Pixner wrote the following in Biblical Archaeology Review. The earliest Christians were all Jews. Okay. Messianic Jews. Moreover, they did not regard themselves as having abandoned Judaism. That's right. There were Judaisms of the first century. They were a sect of Judaism in the first century. Not only were the original Christians all Jewish, but for several centuries, Judeo-Christians and even some Gentile Christians refer to their houses of worship as synagogues. Okay, not churches synagogues because that's what your assembly modeled itself after because it's a jewish sect okay it's within the judaisms not outside of israel up to 70 a.d when romans destroyed jerusalem jews accepted the nazarenes the messianic jews in many of their synagogues in 130 a.d it was decreed that the nazarenes were heretics and this is by Jews, not by Western Christians. Okay, Western Christians don't declare Nazarenes heretics until the fourth century. But in the second century, in 130 AD, the Jews are going to declare that the Nazarenes are heretics. And they are uh, within the Amidah, the standing prayer that they do three times a day. Uh, it was changed placing a curse on the Nazarene if they recited this prayer. Within this prayer, they added a section that uh, was basically saying, may Yahweh or may Yah curse the Nazarenes. May the Lord, may Adonai curse the, the Nazarenes, which means followers of Yeshua. Well, if you are a Nazarene, if you're a follower of Yeshua, you can't say that part of the prayer. So then they would find you out. They would ask you to recite the Amidah. Why don't you lead us in the Amidah if they had any question about you being a follower of um, Yeshua? Because they know you couldn't say that part. And why did they have to do that? Because there were Jewish followers of Yeshua who followed the Torah, who did the traditions. Amen. And there was nothing wrong with that. As long as it didn't violate the Torah, they could do it. So these were Messianic Jews, but they were followers of Yeshua. Okay. And so, yeah, they tried to make them recite the prayer. Now, also, during that time, the rabbis tried to preserve the Jewish heritage and their traditions, all right, their doctrines of men. They try to, this is where rabbinic Judaism is birthed. Now they have to, what, begin to learn how to live without the temple, and they're being scattered in the diaspora. And so they have to create what is called rabbinic Judaism, which turns into Judaisms also. Okay, so... Rabbinic Judaisms is not the same as first century Judaisms. That is something that you have to understand. There are many, many man-made doctrines and teachings that come out of rabbinic Judaism were never there in the first century. So I hope you guys are understanding that. History is a mess. You got to walk through it. It's not so nice, neat, and clean as everyone likes to see. You got to do your homework. Otherwise, you're getting fooled by a lot of these preachers and teachers, okay? Now, even within the Catholic history, all right, Epiphanius writes how current Orthodox Jews feel about Nazarenes in the 4th century. So we know that the Nazarenes are existing in the 4th century. These are Torah observant followers of Yeshua. So they didn't just disappear after the 1st century. No, they're still part of the body of Messiah. Amen. For not only do the Jewish children cherish hatred against the Nazarenes, but the people stand up in the morning at noon and in evening three times per day. They say, may God curse the Nazarenes. That's the Amidah. That's the standing prayer. So the Orthodox Jews are teaching their children to hate the Nazarenes because they believe in Yeshua. They believe in him as Messiah and the Orthodox Jews of that day rejected that. So they are still around. Otherwise, they wouldn't be still standing up and saying this prayer. They're, they're still battling them. All right. Once you guys understand that within the Talmud and Jewish literature, when they talk about the heretics, they're not talking about Gentile Christians. They're talking about Messianic Jews that are believers. 
This means all throughout time, throughout the time of the writing of the Talmud and the development of it and so forth, and the, um, the dispersion of it, okay? They are dealing with Jews that are followers of Yeshua, that are Torah observant, okay? And they are developing man-made doctrines on how to battle that, how to keep them out of their communities, because they're still going to battle them for many centuries to come. This tells you that followers of Yeshua remain Torah observant. Were there, they were, they would be, um, they would just be a remnant, of course, but they're still around, which is why the Talmud in many places talks about the heretics. So, according to Eusebius' history of the church, his writings there, the first fifteen bishops of Jerusalem, starting from James, the brother of Yeshua, were of the circumcision meaning they were Jews, okay? Romans destroyed the Jewish assembly leadership in Jerusalem in 135 AD because of the Bar Kokhba revolt, where Nazarenes did not participate because Bar Kokhba was considered by Jews the Messiah. They couldn't participate. They believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. And because of this revolt, we're going to see a lot of changes in the land of Israel. So this revolt, if you are a Messianic Jew, boy, you were, you know, you were ostracized by your own people because you rejected who they called the Messiah. And Western Christians are not going to let you in because you're Jewish. Replacement theology is beginning here. So they are in a hard place right now. But yes, not only is the Jewish people going to reject them, but Rome is going to institute a gentile bishop at this time in 135 all right his name is mark or mahalia he's the 16th bishop of jerusalem who served from 135 and he died in 156 was the first non-jewish bishop of jerusalem but jerusalem is now being renamed alia capitalina which is a dedication to jupiter so after this revolt the Romans want to wipe out any existence of Jewishness. They changed the name of Israel to Palestine. It's now called the land of Palestine. They changed the city of Jerusalem to Alia Capitolina. And they put in a Gentile bishop. It will not allow a Jewish bishop to rule in the area. What does that tell you? We've got a major change happening here. This is where Western Christianity begins with their doctrines, their doctrines of men. So now we can see how after 135, the end of the Bar Kokhba revolt, even Catholic scholars understand there was no real apostolic succession now occurring in Jerusalem, all right? Meaning the Holy Spirit is picking, they're praying, they're deciding, okay, who's going to be the next bishop? Let the Holy Spirit lead us. No, Rome is telling you what to do. Just like Rome told uh, Israel, who would be the high priest? You had to pay Rome. They weren't following the Torah correctly. No, Rome put in who would ever be high priest or not. Basically, the highest bidder, right? Well, that's happening now with the bishop. And so the actual secession of the apostolic secession in Jerusalem holds. And now it's man made doctrines and it's being done by man. So this is not approved authority by Yahweh, by Yeshua from this point forward. Right. The Roman Empire now installed a Gentile bishop who agreed to not adhere to the laws of Moshe. The laws of Moshe are now being outlawed in the land of Israel by Roman Emperor Hadrian. The Roman Catholics claim that the apostolic secession in Jerusalem ended when Alia Capitolina was erected, as the Catholic Encyclopedia of 1906 notes. The shortest lived apostolic church is that of Jerusalem. In 130, the holy city was destroyed by Hadrian and a new town, Alia Capitolina, erected on the site. Because of this Jewish revolt, Emperor Hadrian outlawed many practices considered to be Jewish. The 20th century historian Salu W. Baron wrote, Hadrian, according to rabbinic sources, he prohibited public gatherings for instructions in Jewish law. He forbade the proper observance of the Sabbath and holidays and outlawed many important rituals. 
So you can see that the Gentile believers in Yeshua, when they're seeing all this, they got to be believing, hey, Israel has been replaced. I mean, we're the ones left standing here. So in their eyes, not understanding covenants, they're thinking Israel has been replaced. This is where we're going to see replacement theology really coming forward is at this time. All right, let's look at J.B. Lightfoot, all right? A scholar himself specifically wrote, but the church of Aaliyah Capitolina was very differently constituted from the church of Pella and the church of Jerusalem. Not a few doubtless accept the conqueror's terms, contend to live hence as Gentiles in the new city of Hadrian. But there were others who hung to the law of their forefathers. Not everyone is folding to the pressure of the world, to the pressure of the Roman Empire, trying to get you to forsake your covenant relationship with Yeshua and walking in Torah. Okay, Not everyone forsook it. The churches of Asia Minor regularly regulated their Easter festival by the Jewish Passover without regard to the day of the week. But those of Rome and Alexandria and Gaul observed another rule thus avoiding even the semblance of Judaism. So what does Lightfoot uh, have to say? It's at this time you start seeing a move from keeping Passover correctly to now moving to only celebrating the resurrection of Yeshua on Sunday. Now, this is only being done by the West, by those of Rome and Alexandria and Gaul. But those in the East, those in Asia, those seven assemblies up there, they are still keeping the Torah. OK, what's happening is Rome is what creating doctrines of men. They're forsaking the scriptures and creating the doctrines of men. And this is what the majority of Western Christians hold to today. This is where your history goes back to. Goes back to the middle of the second century. Doesn't go back to the first century. It is at this time in history. After 135 CE, we now see in Rome, Alexandria, and Gaul a Sunday resurrection celebration, replacing a Nisan 14 Passover seven-day celebration done by all early believers in the first century. Doesn't matter if you were Jew or Gentile, you were taught to keep the Passover. It seems to be because of Emperor uh, Hadrian's anti-Jewish edicts. There is no evidence in scripture earlier Christians, or the way, or Nazarenes, abandoned the command to keep Pesach. Some think this attempt to move celebrating Pesach on the Nisan 14 to a Sunday resurrection celebration only might have been done to persuade Emperor Hadrian that many who profess Christ in Rome were distancing themselves from practices considered to be too closely tied to the Jews who were now out of favor. Okay. Very easy. You got that pressure. You don't want to look like you're still following the ways of the Jews. I mean, obviously, Hadrian made these edicts. He's not looking at the Jews so favorably. So obviously, you're going to start abandoning Passover, Pesach. You're just going to celebrate the resurrection of Yeshua. Okay. So you're giving in to the pressures of the world and abandoning scripture. They, before that, were keeping the commands, keeping the commands of keeping Pesach. So at the time, Messianic Jewish Christianity, Nazarenes, also fell in decline by the growing anti-Judaism, also personified by the heretic Martian, which is happening around 150 AD. This uh, Christian, this believer who later become known as a heretic, they, they classify him as a heretic later, he has very anti-Judaism teachings. Okay, uh, He believes that the old covenant god is not the same as the new covenant god and so he's got all these teachings that you know he turns out to be a false teacher a heretic but what he says about the older covenants in the bible it sticks with a lot of people and so what happens it is believed many nazarenes sought refuge outside the boundaries of the empire in arabia and other places they're being pushed out this is what happens you get pushed out. You have to make a stance. Am I going to follow scripture? Or am I going to follow the doctrines of men? And if the world is pushing on you, they're going to push you out. If you're going to take a stance for the kingdom. 
So in the early mid second century, we also see the theology known today as replacement theology rising within the ranks of the Western of the West. Something Paul refuted in the book of Romans. It looks like Western Christianity in the mid second century is forsaking the writings of Paul found in Romans chapter nine through 11. Paul warns Yahweh has not forsaken his people, Israel. That's what he warns them in chapters nine through 11. I mean, right there within the Roman assemblies, they're starting to, you know, think, hey, have we replaced Israel? Paul makes it very clear. No, no, they have stumbled, but they have not utterly fallen. And there's going to come a time when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, all of Israel will be saved. The body of Messiah is within the covenants of Israel, not outside something called the church. That is a false teaching. Okay, the body of Messiah is inside the covenants of Israel. But it's being forsaken here now in the second century. They are forsaking the book of Romans here. One of the first places one sees the idea of replacement theology is around 155 CE between a Gentile, Justin Martyr, and a Jew named Trifo. Justin tried to convert Trifo to his type of Christianity, right? His type of Christianity is not first century. Christianity, because he already has an idea that Israel is now forsaken. Okay, which then means what the law of Moses is done away with. Once you start with replacement theology, you don't need the law of Moshe anymore. You can start building upon the doctrines of men. You can start rewriting the words of Paul, reinterpreting the words of Paul, because that's not how they were interpreted in the first century. They were pro Torah pro-law of Moshe. All right. In this debate, Justin says, the true spiritual Israel and descendants of Jacob, Judah, uh, Judah, Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham are we who have been led to God through this crucified Christ. Okay. So I get what they're trying to you know, see. They can do see that nationally Israel uh, has fallen uh, out of favor with Yahweh, but it's no different than what happened in Babylon. They're being disciplined. They're not being cast off permanently. They're being disciplined. You see, Justin Martyr doesn't understand the Hebrew scriptures. He doesn't understand covenants. Israel is being disciplined. Does that mean that Justin Martyr can come in by grace and by faith? Absolutely. But for him to start teaching any type of form that he and this group now replace national Israel, that's replacement theology. That is a false teaching. I get why they might be seeing this, but they're looking, they're not walking by faith, they're walking by sight. When you walk by faith, you walk by the scriptures. Okay. When you walk by sight, you let the world influence how you read the scriptures. And we've got to be careful of that. So Justin Martyr also says, we who have been quarried out from the bowels of Christ are the true Israelite race. See? He's talking about replacement theology here. Israel is forsaken. We are the new true Israel. And they're going to spiritualize everything. They're going to make it a spiritualized thing. All right. The Epistle of Barnabas, written somewhere between 80 and 120 CE, says, Take heed now to yourselves and not to be like some, adding largely to, the, to your sins and saying the covenant is both theirs and ours, meaning the nation of Israel and ours. But they thus finally lost it. The nation of Israel has been cast off, is what the Epistle of Barnabas is teaching. So this idea is there, right? This teaching is there, and people are believing it. And that's why they're coming up with the doctrines of men. So Irenaeus wrote around 180 CE, they who boast themselves as being the house of Jacob and the people of Israel are disinherited from the grace of God. Disinherited, gone, replaced. That is false. Any Jew that would come to faith in Yeshua, he doesn't stop being a Jew. He doesn't come into a new religion. No. The body of Messiah in the first century was a sect within the Judaisms of the day. It was Jewish. Okay, replacement theology is a false theology, and it's where most of Protestantism dates back to. Your theology goes all the way back to this, what, second century here, not the first. 
because Protestantism, they're going to do a Reformation, but they're only going to go back to the Nicene Council, basically, right? They're not going to go all the way back to the first century because Martin Luther believed in replacement theology. He believed in the writings of Augustine with the doctrine of original sin and all the, another false teaching, right? So yeah, you've got to know your history. You've got to know your Bible. You got to know the historical setting of the first century. You got to know Torah. You got to know covenants. All right. So origin. He was around 250 CE. Speaks on Matthew 15, 24, and Yeshua's statement pertaining to how he was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Origin states that the lost sheep are not Jews who are carnal Israel, but Christians who are heavenly Israel. So what does he mean by Christians? Well, by the time you get to 250, you've got replacement theology going on. It's a Gentile entity. Israel has been replaced. We are the new Israel. Okay. If you ever wonder why the Roman Catholic Church says we are the new Israel, we are the new covenant. The covenants and promises have been have left the nation of Israel and been passed to us. And that's why they think they are the church. They are the true Israel. This all dates back from here. Okay, and it was never reversed by the Protestant Reformation. That part was never reversed. That is what they held to. So, no, the teachings of Western Christianity do not go back to the first century. Not all of them. Faith in Yeshua, yes, that goes back to the first century. The, the way of the cross and dying on the cross, and that's the only way into the kingdom, that you come in by faith and not by works. Yeah, that goes back to the first century. But when you start talking about, oh, we don't have to follow the law of Moshe anymore, that's been nailed to the cross, now you're contradicting what was going on in the first century. Now you're only going back to Western Christianity. And at most, you're coming back to mid-second century. All right, John Christentum preached in 387 CE in Rome. It is because you killed Christ, it is because you shed the precious blood that there is now no restoration, no mercy anymore, and no defense. You have committed the ultimate transgression. This is why you are being punished worse now than in the past. If this were not the case, God would not have turned his back on you so completely. Okay, John here, I mean, he heavily believes in uh, replacement theology. Okay, he doesn't understand that we all put Messiah on the cross. All of our sins put Messiah on the cross. Not only that, the Father put Messiah on the cross. He sent his son to die for us. Yeshua said, no one takes my life. I lay it down and I put it up again. Yeshua willingly gave his life. He put himself on the cross for our sake, for because of our sins. So yeah, you can see the hatred towards the Jewish nation by John Christendom. All right, so let's understand this even through what historian evidence around 311 AD, Greek historian Eusebius states that Nazarenes was a former name for Christians. Even Jerome, a fourth century Christian priest, concurred that Nazarenes was used to describe Christians. This is first century. Okay, the problem is, is Eusebius and Jerome have abandoned first century Christianity, first century Christian orthodoxy. They've abandoned it. They've taken on replacement theology. They've taken on changing the laws of Moshe, changing the festivals, changing the Sabbath. So their Christianity is not first century Christianity. It comes from the doctrines of men. It comes from the second century, not the first All right, here is some of what the Catholic historian uh, Epheneus wrote in the mid-4th century. The emperor, meaning Constantine, convened a council of 318 bishops in the city of Nicaea. They passed certain uh, um, ecclesiastical canons at the council besides and at the time decreed in regard to Passover that there must be one unanimous concord on the celebration of God's holy and supremely excellent day. For it was variously observed by people. In other words, the Nazarenes are here, right? There are people all over still celebrating Pesach, Passover. 
there is no one Christianity by the time you get to the fourth century. So the Roman emperor is going to decide the fate of all of Christianity in his eyes. We're going to make this all one in my empire, which, of course, his empire didn't conclude all of Christianity, right? It just concluded everything in the Roman Empire. But even within the Roman Empire, there are Torah followers. They're going to keep Pesach, which is why he has to do what he's doing. Okay, so first century Torah followers, they're here in the fourth century, followers of Yeshua. But what we're seeing here is doctrines of men being built within the Roman West sect. So it should be noted and understood, even by some Catholic scholars, that Judeo-Christian assemblies were not represented on, uh, on that uh, council, right? The Council of Nicaea. There were no Jews there. There were no Jewish bishops. Notice what the priest, Balarmano Bagati, wrote. The inhabitants of Syria, of Cilicia, and Mesopotamia were still celebrating Easter or Passover with the Jews. Okay, They were still keeping the Torah, keeping the feast days because they are commanded. The importance of the matters to be discussed and the great division that existed had led Constantine to bring together a big number of bishops, including the confessors of the faith, in order to give the impression that the whole of Christendom was represented. Okay, which it wasn't. There were a lot of people that weren't there. Those 318 bishops didn't represent all of Christianity, but it represented what Constantine wanted, right? So we're going to get doctrines of men here. This is not blessed by Yahweh. This is not approved by Yahweh. This is the doctrines of men. No different than what happens in Yavne when the, all of the rabbis come together to begin to start rabbinic Judaism, right? That's not under the authority of Yahweh, but they're going to make it seem like it is. They're going to convene their own Sanhedrin there and begin to make a, a push and begin to create a Judaism, obviously, that doesn't have the temple. So rabbinic Judaism, doctrines of men, Western Christianity, doctrines of men. Okay, You have to look and see exactly what lines up with scripture and what doesn't. All right, the priest goes on to say, in fact, the churches of Jewish stock had no representation. Sorry, I wrote the word had there twice. From this, we can conclude that no Judean Christian bishop participated in the council. Either they were not invited or they declined to attend. And so the capitalists had a free hand to establish norms for certain practices without meeting opposition or hearing other viewpoints. Isn't that the case even today? Let's line up everyone who agrees with us and now let's make what the community has to do. Don't make sure you don't have anyone that's gonna oppose us in there. Once the road was open, future councils could continue on these lines, thus deepening the breach between the Christians of two stock, Torah followers, non-Torah followers. Torah followers are following the apostolic writings correctly. The non-Torah followers, that was birthed in the second century. They're, they're living off the doctrines of men. Okay. They have anti-Semitic views, anti-Semitism. They have hatred towards the nation of Israel, where a lot of this is coming from. The point of view of the Judeo-Christians, devout of Greek philosophical formation, was that of keeping steadfast to the testimonia and therefore not to admit any word foreign to the Bible. He's speaking of the Nazarenes here. The Nazarenes did not include Greek philosophy in their doctrines. Okay, but Nicene Council did. They're, they're Greeks. They're all Gentiles with no Jewish background. Okay, they have ousted any type of Jewish influence. And yet the whole Bible is Jewish, okay, with a Jewish culture written to Jewish people, amen? And when the Gentiles came in, people like Luke and that, they came into what? A Jewish culture. All right, in 330 AD, church father 
Ephanias of Salamis gives a detailed description of the new faith in Yeshua by the Nazarene. We shall especially consider the heretics who call themselves Nazarenes. Now, this is the first time you're going to start seeing them being called heretics, the Nazarenes. Okay, It's the fourth century when they are called heretics by Western Christians. Okay, The Jews are calling them heretics from the second century. But it's the fourth century when we see Gentile Christians, because of the man-made doctrines they're creating, now they're going to start calling the Nazarenes heretics. Okay. So, we shall especially consider the heretics who call themselves Nazarenes. However, they are simply complete Jews. They use not only the New Testament, but the Old Testament as well, as the Jews do. They have no different ideas, but confess everything exactly as the law proclaims it and in the Jewish fashion, right? That's because the law teaches us that you're not saved by circumcision, okay? You're not saved because you obey the law, of Moshe. You're saved by grace. That's what the Torah teaches. The Torah teaches what? The faith of Abraham, right? When people left Egypt, they left by faith. Both Jew and Gentile were saved by faith, putting their faith and trust in the work of Yahweh. And then they came to Sinai and entered into a covenant. Now you need to follow and obey the law, all right? Abraham followed all of the commandments of Yahweh, Genesis 26, 5. That was after he came to faith in Yahweh. Faith comes first, put in your faith, and then faith is expressed by your works. Okay, works have a role in your salvation, but works don't save you. Okay. So these Nazarenes, who are now called heretics, have no different ideas, but confess everything exactly as the law proclaims it and in the Jewish fashion, except for their belief in Messiah, if you please. For they acknowledge both the resurrection of the dead and the divine creation of all things and declare that God is one and that his son is Yeshua, the Messiah. They are trained to a nicety in Hebrew. For they, like the Jews, read the whole law, Torah, when the pro uh, then the prophets. They differ from the Jews because they believe in the Mashiach and from the Christians in that they are to this day, bound to Jewish rites. So notice the word Christians has changed now, the definition. First century, Torah observant. By the time you get to the fourth century, not Torah observant, man-made doctrines. In that they are to this day bound to the Jewish rites, such as circumcision, the Shabbat, and other ceremonies. Otherwise, this sect of the Nazarenes thrives most vigorously in the state of Berea, uh, Colesiria, and in De uh, Decapolis, around Pella, and Bashan. So there are places where the Nazarenes are flourishing. This is the fourth century. After they departed from Jerusalem, they made their start from here. As all the disciples dwelt in Pella, having been warned by Mashiach to depart Jerusalem and immigrate because of imminent danger, right? So the 70 CE, uh, event, they were told ahead of time to get out, all right? So right around 65 and 66, they're heading out of there. They're heading towards Pella. They're getting out before the Romans surround and destroy Yerushalayim. From there, they maintain the Torah observance. They maintain following Yeshua, his divinity, the virgin birth, all of that. And they begin to spread to other cities from there. And they are known in the fourth century here. So Eusebius of C uh, Caesarea, who was a scholar and historian of Christianity and who was also known as the father of church history, records below. In his account, we see Polycrates, a bishop of the Asian church, testifying that Passover was to be celebrated on the 14th day of the moon when the leaven was put away. And that the apostles Philip and John, all right, these are disciples of Yeshua, among others, observed Passover on the day handed it down to everyone in the Church of Asia. Polycrates also mentions that a multitude of bishops gave their consent to the same letter addressed to the Rome Church of Rome. Okay, they tried to teach Rome. You guys are off. You're you're straying from the truth. But those who were taught by Philip and John maintained the Torah, maintained the truth. That's because all throughout the first century, all believers followed the Torah, followed the Pesach followed Passover. 
there never was a Sunday only worship. Okay. In the first century, this comes later as far as the evidence we see shows. Okay. Polycrates, look up when was he? Okay, he's third century. Right, so when we talk about the East or Asian uh, churches, as they like to call them, which there was no church, these are assemblies here. These are followers of Yeshua. These are the seven assemblies that we see in the book of Revelation. This is what they're calling Asia, okay, where Philip and John resided. We've got Polycarp that reside there also. So church history of Eusebius, all right, he writes, for the parishes of all Asia, as from an older tradition, held that the 14th day of the moon, on which day the Jews were commanded to sacrifice the lamb, should be observed as the feast of the Savior's Passover. Of course it would. It should. Yeshua never changed the law. He never told anyone, when I'm away, then forsake Passover. No. That's why he held up the cup. That's why he held up the wine. Because he expected you to do this in remembrance of him. Passover, the Seder meal, the whole thing. And when you lift up the cup and you lift up uh, the wine, remember him. That is his body and that is his blood. And he died on what? The time of unleavened bread. Passover. During this time, during this season. He died and was resurrected. All right, Eusebius goes on to say, but the bishops of Asia, led by Polycrates, decided to hold to the old custom handed down to them. We observe the exact day, neither adding nor taking away. For in Asia also great lights have fallen asleep, which shall rise again on the day of the Lord's coming, when he shall come with glory from heaven and shall seek all of the saints. Among these are Philip, one of the twelve apostles who fell asleep in uh, Hierop Hieropolis, and his two aged virgin daughters, and another daughter who lived in the Holy Spirit and now rests at Ephesus, and moreover John, who was both a witness and a teacher, who reclined upon the bosom of the Lord, and being a priest, wore the sacerdotal plate. He fell asleep at Ephesus. Okay, so Yochanan lived out his days during the time of, of living in Ephesus. He got off of the island of Patmos and he lived out there where the seven assemblies are. So, and Polycarp in Smyrna, who was a bishop and martyr. Okay, now I'm going to start butchering these names, but stay with me. And Thracius, bishop and martyr from Emenia, who fell asleep in Smyrna. Why need I mention the bishop and martyr Sargeris, who fell asleep in Laodicea, or the blessed Papyrus, or Melito, the eunuch, who lived together in the Holy Spirit and who lies in Sardis, awaiting the episcopate from heaven. When he shall arise from the dead, all those observe the 14th day of Passover according to the Gospels. According to the Gospels, all these observe the 14th day of Passover according to the Gospels, deviating in no respect, but following the rule of faith. And I also, Polycrates, the least of you all, do according to the tradition of my relatives, some of whom I have closely followed. For seven of my relatives were bishops, and I am the eighth. And my relatives also observe the day when the people put away eleven. Okay. He is a Torah observant Gentile following what he was taught by Philip and John. And the disciples kept passing those on. Finally, he gets down to Polycrates, right? Polycarp uh, teaches and continues the tradition on, right? All right, so Eusebius, right? Remember, he's a Roman Catholic. He teaches, and when the blessed Polycarp was at Rome in the time of the Antecedents, and they disagreed a little about certain other things, they immediately made peace with one another, not caring to quarrel over this matter. For neither one could Antisenus persuade Polycarp not to observe what he had always observed with John, the disciple of our Lord, and the other apostles with whom he had associated. Neither could Polycarp persuade Antisenus to observe it 
as he said that he ought to follow the customs of the presbyters that he preceded him. Okay. So those in Rome did not have the authority, but they changed it. And so he's following the customs found in Rome. Polycarp is following what he learned from John. And those in the Asian assemblies up there, the seven assemblies all followed the Torah. They followed the commandments. So they can date their stuff all the way back to Yeshua. But this gentleman here, this is just what their presbyters decided. Doesn't say it, it came from the Lord. Okay. So no, they're following a tradition, the Roman tradition, which begins what in the mid second century. Because we have to understand that Polycarp goes to Rome in 154 CE. You got to bring that out. Okay. Because they've made that change. He's trying to bring them back to the truth. All right. They've written letters and Polycarp's trying to go there to help get them to come back to the truth. But they, they resist. Okay. So he's not going to disfellowship them over it, but they are not following the truth of the scriptures. So Eusebius goes on to say, those in Palestine whom we have recently mentioned, Nar uh, Narcissus and Theophilus, and with them Carcius, bishop of the church of Tyre, and Clarius of the church of Ptolemaeus, and those who met with them, having stated many things respecting the tradition concerning the Passover, which had come to them in succession from the apostles at the close of their writing added these words, endeavoring to send copies of our letters to every church that we may not furnish occasion to those who easily deceive their souls. We show you indeed that also in Alexandria, they kept it on the same day that we do, for letters are carried from us to them and from them to us, so that in the same manner and at the same time, we kept the sacred day, the sacred day of Passover, Nisan 15. Okay, even Eusebius is admitting that there are Torah observant followers, Jewish and Gentiles, throughout time here that are keeping the Torah. Okay, it was not changed in the first century. All right, let's look at the Catholic writer Lopes. Uh, I believe it's pronounced Lopes, noted this about the Roman bishop Victor. Victor the first. He lived in 189 to 199. An African, Victor, tended not to advise other churches, but to impose Rome's idea on them, thus arousing resentment at times in bishops not inclined to accept such impositions. This was the case of Polycrates, the bishop of Ephesus, who felt offended at this interference. The question was again that of Easter. Victor reaffirmed the decisions of Soter and uh, Ele Eleutherius, I know I butchered it, both with regard to the date, which had to be a Sunday, and with regard to several customs of Jewish origin, which were still practiced in some Christian communities. Polycrates justified himself before the Pope with a letter containing the phrase, it is more important to obey God rather than man. Okay, that's exactly what Yeshua said. You nullify the word of God with your traditions. And Polycrates, Polycrates is not going to bow to the traditions of men. He's going to follow the commandments of Yahweh, the commandments of Yeshua, and keeping Passover, not Easter. Okay, we can talk a lot about Easter, that date on there, but to forsake Passover. No, that's violating the Torah. That's violating uh, the commands that's violating the covenant that you have with Yeshua. Let's look at the Protestant historian Philip uh, Saf or Chaff noted. A portion of Jewish Christians, however, adhered even after the destruction of the temple to the national customs of their fathers and propagated themselves in some churches of Syria down to the end of the fourth century under the name of Nazarenes, a name perhaps originally given in contempt by the Jews to all Christians as followers of Jesus of Nazareth. Okay, so 
the Nazarenes, are still being seen in the fourth century as following the Torah. They united the observance of the Mosaic ritual law with their belief in the messianic ship and divinity of Yeshua or divinity of Jesus, used the gospel of the Matthew in, in Hebrew, deeply mourned the unbelief of their brethren and hoped for their future conversion in a body and for a millennial reign of Christ on earth. Amen. So those Nazarenes believed in the divinity of Yeshua. They believed uh, in walking in the Mosaic law. That's the way it was in the first century. All right, he goes on to say, but they indulged no antipathy to the Apostle Paul. In other words, they followed the words of Apostle. They had nothing against the words of Paul, these Nazarenes. They were therefore not heretics, but stunted separatist Christians. They stopped at the obsolete position of a narrow and anxious Jewish Christianity and shrank to an insignificant sect. So obviously through persecution, I mean, when you get into the fourth century, you get heavily persecution if you're following uh, Jewish law, okay? If you're following the Mosaic law. And if you're a Gentile, you can be jailed. You can get in big trouble if they catch you in a synagogue. I mean, later they're going to be outlawed. They're going to jail you. You might even be put to death um, if you're trying to follow what? The Mosaic law. That's what Western Christianity ends up doing. They end up pushing them out, right? It's man-made doctrines. It's not something given by the Lord. So Christian orthodoxy that people keep talking about, that's man-made tradition, not ordained by the Lord. That's what they're talking about. It doesn't date back to the first century. Christian orthodoxy in the first century is messianic. Okay, it's Torah observance in the first century. That's what the word Christian would have meant in the first century. The Nazarenes had long existed, but until the time of Constantine, they simply were not considered to be heretics. Again, fourth century, they're not considered heretics until later, right? Dr. Pritz note that the earliest heresial logics did not include the Nazarenes for the simple reason that they did not consider them to be heretics. We arrive at this important conclusion that the lack of polemic against the Nazarenes until the fourth century does not show that they were a late phenomenon. Rather, it shows that no one until Epineus considered them heretical enough to add them to the older catalogs. No one until Epineus felt it necessary to include the Nazarenes, even though they existed from the earliest times. Now, Jerome, okay, Jerome is late 4th century, early 5th century. He writes, Matthew also called Levi, apostle and a four-time publican, composed a gospel of Christ at first published in Judea and Hebrew for the sake of those of the circumcision who believe, but this was afterwards translated into Greek, though by what author is uncertain. The Hebrew itself has been preserved until the present day in the library uh, at Caesarea, which Pamphilus, yeah, Pamphilus so diligently gathered. He also goes on to say, I have also had the opportunity of having the volume described to me by the Nazarenes of Berea, a city of Syria. So the Nazarenes are here in the 5th century. Late 4th century, early 5th century, the Nazarenes are still around in Syria. Who, you, uh, who used it? In this, it is to be noted that with whatever the evangelist, whatever on his own account or in person of our Lord, the Savior quotes the testimony of the Old Testament. He does not follow the authority of the translators of the Septuagint, but the Hebrew. Wherefore, these two forms existed. Out of Egypt I have called my son, and for he shall be called a Nazarene. Okay, this is by Jerome. So my point is the Nazarenes are still around, late 4th century, early 5th century. From Ephenaeus' description given in the 4th century AD, when Nazarenes had already existed for several hundred years, it can be determined that the Nazarenes were very dependent upon the Jewish world and its traditions. Why? Because it was never to be forsaken. Okay? The law of Moshe was never abolished. It is what the apostolic writings show. 
the apostolic writings show that everyone was to learn the Torah after coming to faith in Yeshua. These were the laws of the kingdom. All right, so the Nazarenes, again, Epheneus, okay, late fourth century bishop. They, the Nazarenes, have no different ideas but confess everything exactly as the law proclaims it and in the Jewish fashion, except for their belief in Christ, if you please. For they acknowledge both the resurrection of the dead and the divine creation of all things and declare that God is one and that his son is Jesus Christ. Epheneus goes on to say, they, Nazarenes, disagree with Jews because they have come to faith in Christ. But since they are still fettered to the law, circumcision, the Sabbath, and the rest, they are not in accord with the Christians. Well, what Christians? Well, fourth century, fifth century Christians who have abandoned the Torah, but that's not first century Christians. Okay. So Epineus is following the doctrines of men. But he's letting you know the Nazarenes are still around. They're still following Torah. They are following the ways of Yahweh, the ways of Yeshua and his disciples. So Epineus also says they, the Nazarenes, use not only the New Testament, but the Old as well, as the Jews do. Remember, Martian, he threw out the Old. You know, he was talking about the Old, um, the old Covenants, right? The Tanakh, what I like to call the Hebrew scriptures, he threw all that out. He just wanted the, the apostolic writings. All right. That was pretty big in Western Christianity. But no, the Nazarenes read it all because it's all about covenants. Amen. And it's all about following Yeshua. Yeshua is fulfilling those covenants. It's ongoing even today. Yeshua said in Matthew chapter 5, verses 19 through 20, I did not come to abolish the Torah or the ways of the prophets or the words of the prophets, but I came to uh, fulfill them. And not one jot or tittle of the law will pass away until all is fulfilled. Amen. But all has not been fulfilled. He's got a second coming still. And so, yes, the law of Moshe is still applicable to our lives today. The temple is going to be coming back in the millennial reign. There'll be animal offerings being done. There'll be a temple. All right. All of that's going to carry on. Just read Jeremiah 33, verses 14 through 26. All right, we're almost done. I know this is long, but it's very important, okay? And he, Heg, uh, Heg, well, this is another hard one. Hegesippius, the Nazarene, quotes some passages from the gospel according to the Hebrews and from the Syriac, the Aramaic, and some uh, particulars from the Hebrew tongue, showing that he was a convert from the Hebrews. And he mentions other matters as taken from the oral tradition of the Jews. Okay, so they're still around here in the late fourth century Torah followers. All right, in the fourth century, Jerome also refers to Nazarenes as those who accept Messiah in such a way that they do not cease to observe the old law. But in the epistle 79 to Augustine, he said, this is Jerome speaking, what shall I say of the Ebonites? Now, the Ebonites don't believe in the deity of Yeshua. So they're out. Okay. They're heretics who pretend to be Christians. Today, there still exists among the Jews in all the synagogues of the East a heresy, which is called that of Minions. Okay. This is the Nazarenes here. This is what I'm talking about. That word here, this word min or Minions. You'll find that in the Talmudic writings. It's talking about Jewish believers in Yeshua. It's talking about the Nazarenes here, okay? And which is still condemned by the Pharisees. Its followers are ordinarily called Nazarenes. They believe that Christ is the Son of God, was born of the Virgin Mary, and they hold to him to be the one who suffered under Pontius Pilate and ascended to heaven, and in whom we also believe. But while they pretend to be both Jews and Christians, they are neither. Okay, That's Jerome's opinion as he writes to Augustine, who has many false doctrines there, the doctrine of original sin and so forth, uh, replacement theology. Um, this is what a lot of Western Christian doctrine comes from. It dates back to Augustine, to the traditions of men, does not go back to the first century. Augustine helps to create a lot of orthodoxy. Christianity, Western Christianity, though. 
Okay. So yeah, Jerome, he has his issues with the Nazarenes, but that's his issues. They are following scripture. They are following the apostolic writings. All right, the following creed is that of a church at Constantinople at the same period, the same time that Jerome is alive, okay? Look what you had to do at this particular church with this creed. This is replacement theology at its best. You have to, I, you have to say, as a believer in Yeshua, I renounce all customs, rites, legalisms, unleavened breads, and sacrifices of lambs of the Hebrews, and all other feasts of the Hebrews, sacrifices, prayers, aspersions, purifications, sanctifications, and pro, uh, propitiations, and fasts, and new moons, and Sabbaths, and superstitions, and hymns, and chants, and observances, and synagogues, and the food and drink of the Hebrews. You had to denounce everything if you were going to be a Christian, right? Is that what Yeshua would have taught? Absolutely not. This goes against the words of Yeshua. He would renounce this. This is replacement theology. This helps you to, uh, in your belief that the law of Moshe has been done away with. And this is false. Goes on to say, in one word, I renounce everything Jewish, every law, right, and custom. And if afterwards I shall wish to deny and return to Jewish superstition or shall be found eating with the Jews or feasting with them or secretly conversing and condemning the Christian religion instead of openly confuting it, uh, confuting them and condemning them in their vain faith, then let the trembling of Gehazi cleave to me as well as the legal punishments to which I acknowledge my liability. And may I be anathema in the world to come and may my soul be set down with Satan and the devils. This is what this church creed wanted you to say. Okay. If you were what? A believer in Yeshua. Especially if you were a Jew. Coming into their Christianity, you would have to say this creed. Okay. And no true follower of Yeshua could say this creed. No true follower of Yeshua could say this creed. Because it supports replacement theology. All right, we're wrapping it up here. So Nazarenes are referred, I'm sorry, Nazarenes are referenced past the 4th century AD as well. Uh, Jacobus D. Foraging in 1230 to 1298 described James as a Nazarene. He describes what? The half-brother of Yeshua as a Nazarene. That would mean a Torah follower in the Golden Legend, Volume 7. Thomas Aquinas, 1225 to 1274, quotes Augustine of Hippo, who was given an apocryphal book called uh, Hieromaeus by a Hebrew of the Nazarene sect in Katina, Aria, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27. So this terminology seems to have remained at least through the 13th century in Europe discussions, okay? Nazarenes, they just were not, uh, there were not many of them in the Roman Empire, right? They were scattered abroad, but they were always there. People who, what? Jewish followers in Messiah Yeshua and Gentile followers who what cling to following Yeshua as the apostolic writings teach to follow the Torah. And that's why today, now you're seeing a resurgent of it, right? It's never fully died out. I don't believe it has. The truth never does. Yahweh protects. It's just like Elijah. When Elijah is standing around thinking he's the only one left, Yahweh reserves what? 7,000 who have not bowed to Baal. Doesn't just because you can't see it, just because Western Christian writings don't show it, doesn't mean it wasn't there. The truth is always there. And now the truth is coming out and it's being resisted by many within Western Christianity. Yeah. Living the kingdom after receiving Yeshua involves following the Torah because it's good for you, it's holy, righteous, and good. So secular history records that the apostle Philip and John, as well as faithful leaders such as Polycarp, Thracius, uh, Sagarius, Melito, 
Apollinarius and Polycrates kept Passover on the 14th day in the first three centuries, even though the Roman Emperor Constantine attempted to forbid it. It was still observed in the fourth century as well as later centuries, showing you that the Torah was still followed. Okay, so when people try to tell me that I'm not following 2,000 years of Christian orthodoxy, they're just totally out of sync. They don't know their history. When you begin to learn how to follow the law of Moshe after coming to faith in Yeshua, and that's kingdom living, you now are going back to the first century, going back to the apostolic writings. And we do this filled with the Holy Spirit, okay? Learning how to love one another, forgive one another, walk with one another, amen? Learning how to walk in the Torah is learning how to walk in repentance, learning how to walk in righteousness. It's what the Torah teaches. It's how you understand what righteousness is. It's where the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truths. And so let's get back to the original. Let's get back to the original teachings of the apostolic writings, where the first century believers were thriving with the power of the Holy Spirit and their faith in Yeshua. They were following also the law of Moshe. We spend so much time talking about the law of Moshe, not because we worship it, not because we put it above Yeshua. It is the thing lacking most in discipleship. And if we are called to be disciples of Yeshua, we need to talk about where the areas are lacking. Where can we strengthen our discipleship? Well, it's in the obedience to the law of Moshe. Because we have the means of forgiveness. When we break the law of Moshe, we can be forgiven through the blood of Yeshua. So we are not uh, trying to trump the blood of Yeshua. We're not... Uh, uh, trying to discount the blood of Yeshua? No. We are what? Showing you the worth of the blood of Yeshua. Because when you sin, it is the blood of Yeshua that covers your sins. What determines sin? The law of Moshe. So everything points you to Messiah. He is my Savior. He is my King. He is my God. And we are servants in the kingdom. And the laws of the kingdom are found in the law of Moshe. So let's walk in powered by the Holy Spirit as we follow Yeshua, amen, and we will follow the law of Moshe. So blessings, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this. This is the history lesson that I wanted you to share. Go ahead and test all things and see if this contradicts what you've learned and this is truth. I believe it is truth. Then we have to change our lifestyle. That's what I had to do. I had to abandon Western Christian doctrines and cling to the word of God and begin to learn his ways so I can follow Yeshua closely. He is my all in all. Amen. Blessings, everyone. Until we meet again, shalom.